Section three of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. The Insanity of Jones, Chapter Three. Next day, and for several weeks thereafter, the business of the office went on as usual and Jones did his work well and behaved outwardly with perfect propriety. No more visions troubled him, and his relations with the manager became, if anything, somewhat smoother and easier. True, the man looked a little different, because the clerk kept seeing him with his inner and outer eye promiscuously, so that one moment he was broad and red-faced, and the next he was tall, thin and dark, enveloped, as it were, in a sort of black atmosphere tinged with red, while at times a confusion of the two sights took place, and Jones saw the two faces mingled in a composite countenance that was very horrible indeed to contemplate. But beyond this occasional change in the outward appearance of the manager, there was nothing that the secretary noticed as a result of his vision, and business went on more or less as before, and perhaps even with a little less friction. But in the rooms under the roof in Bloomsbury it was different for there it was perfectly clear to Jones that Thorpe had come to take up his abode with him. He never saw him, but he knew all the time that he was there. Every night, upon returning from his work, he was greeted by the well-known whisper, "'Be ready when I give the sign,' and often in the night he woke up suddenly out of deep sleep, and was aware that Thorpe had that minute moved away from his bed, and was standing waiting and watching somewhere in the darkness of the room." Often he followed him down the stairs, though the dim gas-jet on the landing never revealed his outline, and sometimes he did not come into the room at all, but hovered outside the window, peering through the dirty panes or sending his whisper into the chamber in the whistling of the wind. For Thorpe had come to stay, and Jones knew that he would not get rid of him until he had fulfilled the ends of justice, and accomplished the purpose for which he was waiting." Meanwhile, as the days passed, he went through a tremendous struggle with himself, and came to the perfectly honest decision that the level of a great forgiveness was impossible for him, and that he must therefore accept the alternative and use the secret knowledge placed in his hands, and execute justice. And once this decision was arrived at, he noticed that Thorpe no longer left him alone during the day as before, but now accompanied him to the office, and stayed more or less at his side all through business hours as well. His whisper made itself heard in the streets, and in the train, and even in the manager's room where he worked, sometimes warning, sometimes urging, but never for a moment suggesting the abandonment of the main purpose, and more than once so plainly audible that the clerk felt certain others must have heard it as well as himself. His obsession was complete, he felt he was always under Thorpe's eye, day and night, and he knew he must acquit himself like a man when the moment came, or prove a failure in his own sight as well as in the sight of the other. And now that his mind was made up, nothing could prevent the carrying out of the sentence. He bought a pistol and spent his Saturday afternoons practising at a target in lonely places along the Essex shore, marking out in the sand the exact measurements of the manager's room. Sundays he occupied in like fashion, putting up at an inn overnight for the purpose, spending the money that usually went into the savings bank on travel expenses and cartridges. Everything was done very thoroughly, for there must be no possibility of failure, and at the end of several weeks he had become so expert with his six-shooter that at a distance of twenty-five feet, which was the greatest length of the manager's room, he could pick the inside out of a halfpenny nine times out of a dozen, and leave a clean, unbroken rim. There was not the slightest desire to delay. He had thought the matter over from every point of view his mind could reach, and his purpose was inflexible. Indeed, he felt proud to think that he had been chosen as the instrument of justice in the infliction of so well-deserved and so terrible a punishment. Vengeance may have had some part in his decision, but he could not help that, for he still felt at times the hot chains burning his wrists and ankles with fierce agony through to the bone. He remembered the hideous pain of his slowly roasting back, and the point when he thought death must intervene to end his suffering, but instead new powers of endurance had surged up in him, and awful further stretches of pain had opened up, and unconsciousness seemed farther off than ever. Then at last— the hot irons in his eyes. It all came back to him, 
and caused him to break out in icy perspiration at the mere thought of it, the vile face at the panel, the expression of the dark face, his fingers worked, his blood boiled, it was utterly impossible to keep the idea of vengeance altogether out of his mind. Several times he was temporarily balked of his prey. Odd things happened to stop him when he was on the point of action. The first day, for instance, the manager fainted from the heat. Another time, when he had decided to do the deed, the manager did not come down to the office at all, and a third time, when his hand was actually in his hip pocket, he suddenly heard Thorpe's horrid whisper telling him to wait, and turning, he saw that the head cashier had entered the room noiselessly without his noticing it. Thorpe evidently knew what he was about, and did not intend to let the clerk bungle the matter. He fancied, moreover, that the head cashier was watching him. He was always meeting him in unexpected corners and places, and the cashier never seemed to have an adequate excuse for being there. His movements seemed suddenly of a particular interest to others in the office as well, for clerks were always being sent to ask him unnecessary questions, and there was apparently a general design to keep him under a sort of surveillance, so that he was never much alone with the manager in the private room where they worked. And once the cashier had even gone so far as to suggest that he could take his holiday earlier than usual if he liked, as the work had been very arduous of late and the heat exceedingly tiring. He noticed, too, that he was sometimes followed by a certain individual in the streets, a careless-looking sort of man who never came face to face with him, or actually ran into him, but who was always in his train or omnibus, and whose eye he often caught observing him over the top of his newspaper, and who, on one occasion, was even waiting at the door of his lodgings when he came out to dine. There were other indications, too, of various sorts, that led him to think something was at work to defeat his purpose, and that he must act at once before these hostile forces could prevent. And so the end came very swiftly, and was thoroughly approved by Thorpe. It was towards the close of July, and one of the hottest days London had ever known, for the city was like an oven, and the particles of dust seemed to burn the throats of the unfortunate toilers in street and office. The portly manager, who suffered cruelly owing to his size, came down perspiring and gasping with the heat. He carried a light-coloured umbrella to protect his head. "'He'll want something more than that, though,' Jones laughed quietly to himself when he saw him enter. The pistol was safely in his hip pocket, every one of its six chambers loaded. The manager saw the smile on his face, and gave him a long, steady look as he sat down to his desk in the corner. A few minutes later he touched the bell for the head cashier, a single ring, and then asked Jones to fetch some papers from another safe in the room upstairs. A deep inner trembling seized the secretary as he noticed these precautions, for he saw that the hostile forces were at work against him, and yet he felt he could delay no longer and must act that very morning interference or no interference. However, he went obediently up in the lift to the next floor, and while fumbling with the combination of the safe known only to himself, the cashier and the manager, he again heard Thorpe's horrid whisper just behind him, "'You must do it today. You must do it today.' He came down again with the papers, and found the manager alone. The room was like a furnace, and a wave of dead, heated air met him in the face as he went in. The moment he passed the doorway, he realised that he had been the subject of conversation between the head cashier and his enemy. They had been discussing him. Perhaps an inkling of his secret had somehow got into their minds. They had been watching him for days past. They had become suspicious. Clearly he must act now, or let the opportunity slip by, perhaps forever. He heard Thorpe's voice in his ear, but this time it was no mere whisper, but a plain human voice speaking aloud. Now, it said, do it now. The room was empty, only the manager and himself were in it. Jones turned from his desk where he had been standing and locked the door leading to the main office. He saw the arms of clerks scribbling in their shirt sleeves, for the upper half of the door was of glass. He had perfect control of himself, and his heart was beating steadily. The manager, hearing the key turn in the lock, looked up sharply. What's that you're doing? he asked quickly. "'Only locking the door, sir,' replied the secretary in a quiet, even voice. "'Why? Who told you to—' "'The voice of justice, sir,' replied Jones, looking steadily into the hated face. The manager looked black for a moment, and stared angrily across the room at him. 
Then suddenly his expression changed as he stared, and he tried to smile. It was meant to be a kind smile, evidently, but it only succeeded in being frightened. "'That is a good idea in this weather,' he said lightly. "'But it would be much better to lock it on the outside, wouldn't it, Mr. Jones?' "'I think not, sir. You might escape me then. Now you can't.' Jones took out his pistol and pointed it at the other's face. Down the barrel he saw the features of the tall dark man, evil and sinister. Then the outline trembled a little, and the face of the manager slipped back into its place. It was white as death and shining with perspiration. "'You tortured me to death four hundred years ago,' said the clerk in the same steady voice. "'And now the dispensers of justice have chosen me to punish you.' The manager's face turned to flame and then back to chalk again. He made a quick movement toward the telephone bell, stretching out a hand to reach it, but at the same moment Jones pulled the trigger and the wrist was shattered, splashing the wall behind with blood. "'That's one place where the chain's burnt,' he said quietly to himself. His hand was absolutely steady, and he felt that he was a hero. The manager was on his feet, with a scream of pain, supporting himself with his right hand on the desk in front of him, but Jones pressed the trigger again, and a bullet flew into the other wrist, so that the big man, deprived of support, fell forward with a crash onto the desk. "'You damned madman!' shrieked the manager. "'Drop that pistol!' "'That's another place,' was all Jones said, still taking careful aim for another shot." The big man, screaming and blundering, scrambled beneath the desk, making frantic efforts to hide, but the secretary took a step forward and fired two shots in quick succession into his projecting legs, hitting first one ankle and then the other and smashing them horribly. Two more places where the chains burnt, he said, going a little nearer. The manager, still shrieking, tried desperately to squeeze his bulk behind the shelter of the opening beneath the desk, but he was far too large, and his bald head protruded through on the other side. Jones caught him by the scruff of his great neck, and dragged him yelping out onto the carpet. He was covered with blood, and flopped helplessly upon his broken wrists. "'Be quick now!' cried the voice of Thorpe. There was a tremendous commotion and a banging at the door, and Jones gripped his pistol tightly. Something seemed to crash through his brain, clearing it for a second, so that he thought he saw beside him a great veiled figure with drawn sword and flaming eyes and sternly approving attitude. "'Remember the eyes! Remember the eyes!' hissed Thorpe in the air above him. Jones felt like a god, with a god's power. Vengeance disappeared from his mind. He was acting impersonally as an instrument in the hands of the invisibles who dispense justice and balance accounts. He bent down and put the barrel close into the other's face, smiling a little as he saw the childish efforts of the arms to cover his head. Then he pulled the trigger, and a bullet went straight into the right eye, blackening the skin. Moving the pistol two inches to the other way, he sent another bullet crashing into the left eye. Then he stood upright over his victim with a deep sigh of satisfaction. The manager wriggled convulsively for the space of a single second— and then lay still in death. There was not a moment to lose, for the door was already broken in and violent hands were at his neck. Jones put the pistol to his temple and once more pressed the trigger with his finger. But this time there was no report. Only a little dead click answered the pressure, for the secretary had forgotten that the pistol had only six chambers and that he had used them all. He threw the useless weapon on to the floor, laughing a little out loud, and turned, without a struggle, to give himself up. "'I had to do it,' he said quietly, while they tied him. "'It was simply my duty, and now I am ready to face the consequences, and Thorpe will be proud of me, for justice has been done, and the gods are satisfied.' He made not the slightest resistance, and when the two policemen marched him off through the crowd of shuddering little clerks in the office, he again saw the veiled figure moving majestically in front of him, making slow, sweeping circles with the flaming sword to keep back the host of faces that were thronging in upon him from the other region. End of chapter 3 of The Insanity of Jones